Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishur. In this session, we will be dealing with the topic, Pharyngeal Apparatus. So, before moving on to the topic, let us discuss a condition known as Lingual Thyroid. You all know the thyroid is seated in the neck. So, what do you mean by Lingual Thyroid? So, this is a type of ectopic thyroid. Ectopic thyroid means the thyroid which is not seen in the usual position of the thyroid gland. There is lack of normal caudal migration of the thyroid gland. So from the initial position, it, there is lack of caudal migration of the thyroid gland. That results in lingual thyroid. So in order to understand such anomalies, you should know first how the thyroid gland normally develops. So in this session, we will be dealing with the development of the pharyngeal apparatus, derivatives of the pharyngeal apparatus, development of the thyroid gland, development of tongue and a little bit of applied aspects. So first see what do you mean by a pharyngeal apparatus. We know that the neck, the neck of the embryo is unrecognizable in a four week of embryo. That means the neck, you won't be able to visualize the neck if you take a four week old embryo. Fourth to fifth week, that is the time when you get the development of pharyngeal arches or branchial arches. So they start appearing in the lateral part of the primitive pharynx. This is the head of the developing, the primitive region of head. This is the cephalic end and in this region you will get the primitive gut tube developing. So this can be considered as the pharyngeal portion. So when you have a look at this region, you know that uh, the neck is not properly developed. So in this region, the region of the primitive pharynx, this is the side view. That means the lateral wall of pharynx. You can see many arches. So these are U-shaped arches lying on the ventral aspect of the primitive pharynx. They are not encircling the entire neck. They are just seen as U-shaped arches on the ventral aspect of the primitive pharyngeal wall. This is made up of a core of mesenchymal tissue. So this is a section. If you take a section here and if you view from the inner aspect, this is as seen from the inner aspect. You can see the cut sections of all these pharyngeal arches here. So if you have a look at this, you can see a core of mesenchymal tissue. This is the core of mesenchymal tissue. This pink colored region is the core of mesenchymal tissue. And this is the outer aspect and this is the inner aspect. This is actually the floor of the primitive pharynx. So this is the outer aspect and this is the inner aspect. In between you have the core. So the core is actually made up of mesenchymal tissue. Outside, this is the outside and this will be made up of ectoderm. So outside is by the ectoderm and the inner lining means we have already mentioned that the inner aspect is the primitive pharynx. So the lining of the pharynx will be endoderm. So if you take these arches, you can see that the core is made up of mesenchymal tissue. The outer aspect is covered by ectoderm and the inner aspect is lined by endoderm. And what about the mesenchymal portion? Which mesoderm do you have here? This is the paraxial mesoderm uh, which you get in the mesenchymal portion. Now, uh, what do you mean by ectodermal cleft? What do you mean by mesodermal core? What do you mean by endodermal pouch? And what do you mean by closing membrane? All these are components of the pharyngeal apparatus. So you have pharyngeal arches, six pairs of pharyngeal arches from either side meet in the midline to form U-shaped pharyngeal arches. Now what happens is you have the outer covering as the ectoderm, you have the inner lining as the endoderm and the intermediate region will be the mesoderm. 
So let's see. So the mesodermal co core is very clear. The pink colored region is the mesodermal core. What do you mean by the ectodermal cleft? When the ectoderm covers this uh, pharyngeal arches, in between each arch, we have already mentioned that there are six arches, in between these arches there is a dipping. So this cleft, you can see the darker regions here. So these are known as the clefts in the ectoderm. That is what is meant by ectodermal cleft. Now what do you mean by endodermal pouch? As the endoderm lines the inner aspect of the pharyngeal arches, again similar to the ectodermal cleft, they also dip in between the pharyngeal arches. So these dips from the inner aspect, from the inner aspect means as you look from the inner aspect of the primitive pharynx, you can see the dips on the endoderm between the pharyngeal arches. They are known as endodermal pouches. So you have a set of ectodermal clefts on the outer aspect and endodermal pouches on the inner aspect and in between you have the mesodermal core. So this is a cut section here and you are standing inside the primitive pharynx and you are having a look at it. So this is the floor of the primitive pharynx. Now what do you mean by closing membrane? So this is the ectodermal cleft, this is the endodermal pouch. So the point where these two meets, this is known as the closing membrane. So closing membrane is a region where uh, or it is the region lying between the ectodermal cleft on one side and the endodermal pouch on the other side. Now you can see that uh, the ectodermal cleft is otherwise known as pharyngeal cleft or pharyngeal group. Similarly, the endodermal pouch on the inner aspect is known as pharyngeal pouches. So these clefts and pouches are actually seen between the arches. So this is the ectodermal cleft, this is the mesodermal core, this is the endodermal pouch and you have the closing membrane between the ectodermal cleft and the endodermal pouch. Now uh, we have just mentioned about the closing membrane, the ectoderm of the cleft meets the endoderm of the pouch at this region. You can see the closing membrane at every junction between the ectodermal cleft and the endodermal pouch. So altogether you have six arches in the beginning but fifth arch usually disappears. So ultimately there will be only five arches. So as you get the five arches how many clefts and how many pouches and how many closing membranes will be formed. So when you have the five arches, you will be having the four clefts. This is the first cleft. So the clefts are seen from the external aspect. So this is the first cleft, this is the second one, third one and fourth one. So the, there are four clefts for the pharyngeal arch. Now how many pouches are there? Again from you, when you look from the inner aspect, you have five pouches among which the fifth one is usually considered as a rudimentary pouch. So you have the first pouch here, second pouch, third pouch, fourth pouch and the fifth pouch altogether here. So one, two, three, four and a five, fifth one that is usually rudimentary. So there are five pouches, four clefts and uh, you will be having four closing membranes. Closing membranes are the membranes lying between the cleft and the pouch. So if you take the first closing membrane, this is the cleft and this is the pouch. So this region is known as the closing membrane. So uh, such four closing membranes you will be getting. And how many arches are there? Fifth one usually disappears. So altogether out of the six arches, if one is less, you will get five arches. So this is uh, what is constituting the formation of brachial apparatus. Four cleft, five pouches four closing membranes and five arches. So this is a pouch, this is the closing membrane and you have the arches. So you can count the arches, the first arch, the second arch, third arch, fourth arch and fifth arch. Out of six arches, fifth one is disappearing. So altogether you will be having five arches. Now the branchial apparatus forms. What are the parts derived from the branchial apparatus in a nutshell? You have the face, you have the neck, you have the definitive mouth, you have the pharynx, you have the larynx, all these are actually derived from the branchial apparatus. 
So now it's time for us to know the derivatives of each part. That means we already mentioned that there are cleft, there are pouches, there are mesodermal cores. So first let's see what are the derivatives of mesoderm. Derivatives of ectoderm, derivatives of endoderm. So first one is derivatives of mesoderm. So mesodermal cells are actually said to be pluripotent. The word pluripotent means it can give rise to any types of tissue. So mesodermal core contains a skeletal element. Skeletal element means it is usually cartilaginous and sometimes these cartilaginous material might give rise to bones in later course of development. It also contains striated muscle, the muscles supplied by the corresponding nerves. Then it contains arterial arches. So during development you have the pharyngeal arches arranged in the neck and you have the dorsal iota and ventral iota. So these dorsal iota and ventral iota are connected by aortic arterial arches. So these aortic arches will be passing through each arch. So the arterial arch contains the aortic arches connected. So these aortic arches are the connections between the dorsal iota and ventral iota and these aortic arches will be passing through the pharyngeal arches. And you also get nerves in order to supply the muscles of this region. So you have the skeletal element, usually the cartilaginous model which will be developing into bones later sometimes. Then you have the striated muscle with its corresponding nerve supply. Then you have the arterial arches, they are known as the aortic arch arteries which connects the dorsal iota with the ventral iota. Then you have the nerves which are supplying the corresponding muscles. So this is about the musculoskeletal derivatives of pharyngeal arches uh, at one look. So first we will see the first arch. The first arch, another name given to the first arch is known as the mandibular arch. So which is the nerve of the arch? The nerve of the arch is known as mandibular nerve and this mandibular nerve is post-traumatic nerve. You will come to the details of post-traumatic and pre-traumatic later. For the time being, the nerve of the arch is mandibular nerve and it is a post-traumatic nerve. Only for the first arch, you have an additional nerve that is called pre-traumatic nerve. So in human beings, usually you won't get any pre-traumatic nerve, but there is an exception for the first arch. So for the first arch, you have a pre-traumatic nerve that is the caudate tympani nerve, a branch of facial nerve. Now, when you consider the skeleton of the first arch, the cartilage first formed is known as the Meckel's cartilage and this will give rise to or this will ossify later to form the mandible, the malleus and incus. Like the mandibular process, there is a maxillary process which will be giving rise to premaxilla, maxilla, zygomatic bone and a part of temporal bone is also formed in this region. Now coming to the muscles uh, formed from this first arch, you have almost all the muscles of mastication formed from the first arch. They will be also giving rise to the anterior belly of digastric. Digastric is a muscle with two bellies, but only the anterior belly is developing from the first arch. You will have tensor tympani and also tensor belly palatini. So these are the major muscles derived from the first arch. Just by knowing the nerve supply, you will get to know the muscles which you get here because you know the muscles of mastication are supplied by the mandibular nerve. Now the ligaments which are formed in the first arch are the anterior ligament of malleus and the sphenomandibular ligament. So let's see, this is the first arch. You can see here it is the cartilage, Michael's cartilage. This is the first arch or the mandibular arch. You have the maxillary process and mandibular process belonging to the first arch. The Michael's cartilage will ossify to form a portion of mandible. It will also give rise to the malleus and incus. Malleus and incus are the small bones found inside the ear. They are the ear ossicles and there are mainly three ear ossicles out of which the two. That is the, ma the malleus and incus are derived from the first arch. Along with that you will get the anterior ligament of malleus as well as sphenomandibular ligament formed within the first pharyngeal arch. So, we will move on to the second arch derivatives. Second arch is otherwise known as hyoid arch and uh, the nerve supply of this arch is mainly the facial nerve. The skeletal framework 
at first you get the Rachel's cartilage in this region which will be later ossifying to form the stapes, the styloid process, the small horn and the superior portion of the hyoid bone. The interesting fact here is uh, you can see that uh, all the words start with a small letter, a particular letter known as S. Here you can make the lesser horn as the small horn of uh, hyoid bone, you can make the upper portion as the superior portion of the hyoid bone. So if you just convert these two words, then you can say that all the words are having uh, a letter in common, that is the word S. So second arch is also starting with the word S. So the skeletal derivatives, the cartilage is Richard's cartilage. Uh, this will be giving rise to the following bones. They are the stapes, the third ear ossicle. Then you have the styloid process. Then you have the small horn and the superior portion of the body of the hyoid bone. Now coming to the muscles of the second arch. Since it is the facial nerve, you should get the muscles of facial expression here along with stapedius and posterior belly of digastric along with stylohyoid. So the interesting fact here is you know the posterior belly of digastric is supplied by the facial nerve whereas the anterior belly is supplied by the mandibular nerve because the anterior belly is derived from the first arch and the posterior belly is derived from the second arch. So this point you have to keep in mind. Now the ligament which you get here is known as the stylohyoid ligament. So these are the derivatives of second arch. So you just concentrate here. This is the second arch region. The Cartilage which you get here is known as the Richards cartilage which will later ossify to form the stapes. So that is the third ossicle. Then you have the styloid process developed here. Then you have the stylohyoid ligament, the ligament which connects the styloid process with the hyoid bone. Then you have the small horn of the hyoid with the superior portion of the hyoid bone. So it is again a rule of S. All the words will be having the starting letter as S. Now coming to the third arch, third arch there is no particular name given to the third arch like the first and second arches. Now uh, the nerve of the third arch is the glossopharyngeal nerve. So glossopharyngeal nerve the only muscle which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve is stylopharynges that is the only muscle derived from the third arch and the skeletal component is the greater horn of the hyoid bone. The lesser horn was actually developing from the second arch. So the greater horn of hyoid bone is developing from the third arch. There is no particular ligament attributed to this region. So we can see the greater horn and the body, the uh, lower portion of the body of the hyoid bone, they are derived from the third arch. Now coming to the fourth and sixth arches. Fifth arch is actually disappearing. So you have two more arches remaining. They are the fourth arch and sixth arch. So fourth arch is supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve and the sixth arch is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Both are actually derived from the nerve vagus. So fourth arch is supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve and the sixth arch is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. What are the skeletal components? From the fourth arch you have the laryngeal cartilages. Uh, actually the thyroid cricoid and arytenoid. All these laryngeal cartilages are derived from the fourth and sixth arches. Now about the muscles of the 4th and 6th arches together, you have the cricothyroid, you have the levator palatini, you have the constrictors of the larynx and uh, you have the intrinsic muscles of larynx. So all these muscles are actually derived from the 4th and 6th arches. Cricothyroid is the only intrinsic muscle of larynx which is lying outside. So that is supplied by the external laryngeal nerve whereas rest of the intrinsic muscles of larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So all these nerve supply can be explained with respect to the uh, derivatives or the structures from which they are derived, especially the branchial apparatus here. Now I would like to comment something about the nerves of the arches. So nerves actually run along the cranial border as well as along the caudal border of the arches. When you take this single arch, you can see that this is the cranial border of the arch. Cranial border means the border lying closer to the head. Uh, this is the caudal border. Okay. So the nerve which runs along, so if you take this second arch, this is the cranial border. So the nerve which runs along the cranial border of the arch is known as post traumatic nerve and the nerve which runs along the caudal border. So if you take the first arch as this, this is the caudal border 
So the nerve which runs along the caudal border of the arch is known as the pre-traumatic nerve. So why it is named as pre and post-traumatic nerve? This ectodermal cleft region is actually known as trima. So this cleft region as the nerve enters, this is the region which is lying before this trima. That is why the nerve which goes above it, you call it as pre-traumatic and the region which lies below this trima, you call uh, the nerve going to that region as post-traumatic. So in human beings, only the first arch is having a double innervation. That is, the first arch is having both post-traumatic as well as pre-traumatic nerves. Whereas, all the rest of the arches are having only post-traumatic nerve. So mandibular nerve is the post-traumatic nerve of the first arch. Along with that, you have one more nerve coming from the lower arch nerve that is the pre-traumatic nerve. So if you take the first arch, the post-traumatic nerve is the mandibular nerve and the pre-traumatic nerve is the caudate tympani nerve which is a branch of facial nerve. So this is the post-traumatic and the first one is the pre-traumatic nerve. Now uh, we will see the derivatives of pouches. So till we discussed about the mesodermal core and uh, since the mesodermal core is made up of pluripotent mesodermal cells, we have all the derivatives of the pluripotent cells. We can uh, get the skeletal elements, we can get the arterial, we can get the nervous component, we can get the muscle as well. Now we are moving on to the derivatives of the pouches. So this is known as the first pharyngeal pouch. So this first pharyngeal pouch, the dorsal portion is actually fusing with the dorsal portion of the second pouch to form a recess. This recess is known as tubotympanic recess. So what are the derivatives of this tubotympanic recess? The tubotympanic recess or pharyngotympanic tube uh, is the portion derived from this proximal portion of the tubotympanic recess. So tubotympanic recess is a recess formed by the fusion of the dorsal part of the first pouch along with the second pouch. This is resulting in the formation of tubotympanic recess. Uh, the main derivative uh, which is seen from the proximal portion of the tub tubotympanic recess is the pharyngotympanic tube and uh, the distal part the distal part of the tubotympanic recess. This is the distal part and this is the proximal part. Proximal part is giving rise to pharyngotympanic tube and the distal portion is giving rise to middle cavity and tympanic antrum. So these are the major derivatives of the first pouch. Now let us see what are the derivatives of the second pouch. So this is the uh, second pouch. The ventral part of the second pouch is actually giving rise to tonsil. Which tonsil? It is the palatine tonsil which is derived from the ventral aspect of the second pouch. The dorsal part actually is getting fused with the dorsal part of the first pouch to form the tubotympanic recess which is giving rise to the pharyngotympanic tube and the middle ear cavity as we have already discussed. So this is the ventral part which is giving rise to the formation of palatine tonsil. Now coming to the third pouch, so the first pouch over, the second pouch over, now coming to the third pouch. Third pouch you have the inferior parathyroid and the thymus gland developing in the third pouch. Inferior parathyroid is actually moving down along with the thymus and lying at an inferior position behind the thyroid gland. Hence uh, this uh, parathyroid is called as inferior parathyroid. But what about the fourth pouch? It is the superior parathyroid glands and thyroid you get from the fourth pouch. So fourth pouch will descend down and it will be lying in the upper portion posterior to the thyroid gland in order to form the superior parathyroid. Whereas the inferior parathyroid will be going along with the thymus because the thymus has to travel a long distance down it will go along with the thymus and it will occupy a lower position behind the thyroid gland. Hence that gland is known as inferior parathyroid. It is not depending upon the position here that it is no, named as superior parathyroid and inferior parathyroid. That point you have to keep in mind. So the fourth pouch is actually giving rise to superior parathyroid gland and the uh, some portions of the thyroid gland. We will see to it. 
Till now we discussed about the derivatives of pouches till fourth pouch. Now let's see the derivative of the fifth pouch. Fifth pouch is actually considered as a rudimentary pouch and it is the ultimobranchial pouch. So the fourth pouch and the fifth pouch combines together and forms the caudal pharyngeal complex. So it, in this region, this fifth pouch which is rudimentary will be actually fusing with the fourth pouch to form the caudal pharyngeal complex. Why caudal means this is the cranial most and this is the caudal most and the last arches. So the caudal region you get a pouch uh, or the complex of pouches that is formed by the fusion of fourth and fifth pouch. So this is known as the caudal pharyngeal complex. This complex is responsible for the formation of parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. So this is the region where you get the caudal pharyngeal complex. So that is about the derivatives of the pouches. Now let us see the derivatives of the clefts or the ectodermal clefts, pharyngeal clefts or the ectodermal clefts. So let us see the first cleft, this is the first cleft. The dorsal part of the first cleft is actually forming the external acoustic meatus. You can see this is the part of medulla which is formed uh, from the pharyngotympanic tube that is the uh, tuber tympanic recess is actually giving rise to a proximal portion which is forming the pharyngotympanic tube and the distal portion is actually forming the medulla cavity. So the cleft which is lying in line with this, it is the first ectodermal cleft that is actually giving rise to the formation of external acoustic meatus. So the external acoustic meatus will be actually moving towards this middle ear cavity. So in between these two cavities, you will be getting the formation of tympanic membrane. So if you take this as the tympanic membrane, you can see that there is a mesodermal core here. You get the ectodermal portion on the outer aspect and the endodermal portion on the inner aspect. So this is the future position of the tympanic membrane. When we discuss about the development of tympanic membrane, we usually say that it is made up of three derivatives from the three germ layers. So this is the reason that is the first pouch is actually first pouch is actually uh, near the first cleft and these two are almost coming in contact with each other just separated by the mesodermal core. So it is at this region you get the formation of future tympanic membrane. Now the ventral part of the cleft is usually obliterated. Considering the rest of the clefts, you have the second cleft, you have the third cleft and you have the fourth cleft here. These clefts are usually obliterated by the overgrowth of the second arch. So this arch will be just growing over these clefts and this will be just obliterated without giving rise to any particular derivatives. So this is about the uh, derivatives of the ectodermal cleft. Now let us see in particular the development of the thyroid gland. When you talk about the thyroid gland, it is derived from two main sources. One is the thyroglossal duct and the other one is the caudal pharyngeal complex. We have already mentioned that the caudal pharyngeal complex is formed by the fusion of the fourth and the fifth pharyngeal pouches. So the parafollicular cells or C cells which produce calcitonin in man uh, is actually formed from the caudal pharyngeal complex whereas the rest of the portion of the thyroid gland is derived from the thyroglossal duct. So this is the thyroglossal duct, you can see it. This is a lateral view. So the thyroglossal duct, you can see it coming anteriorly and giving rise to the uh, lobes of the thyroid gland. So let's see uh, what do you mean by the thyroglossal duct. You, you, we have already mentioned about the mandibular arches, the first arch. So the two arches from each side will be actually uh, getting fused in the midline and uh, there will be an elevation that is known as the tuberculum impar. The mandibular arches when they come closer to the midline, they will be just separated by an elevation known as the tuberculum impar. Just behind this tuberculum impar, so this is the region of tuberculum impar, just behind this tuberculum impar, uh, you get another elevation which is uh, just a thickening of the endoderm. So just another elevation behind the tuberculum impar at this region that is formed by the thickening of the endoderm. Now what happens is there is an invagination along this thickening towards the caudal aspect and this invagination is actually the thyroglossal duct. 
So, there is a thickening behind the tuberculum impar. Uh, the thickening is formed by the endoderm and there is an invagination into the this thickening and this invagination will be actually uh, carried towards the caudal region as a canal. This canal is known as the thyroglossal duct. So, uh, the, future, uh, the point from which the evagination happened, this is known as the foramen cecum. So, in adults, once the thyroglossal ducts gets obliterated, that uh, dipping can be seen as a foramen that is known as the foramen cecum. So, the depression seen on the dosum of tongue. So, this will be the future tongue. So, the depression seen at the dosum of the tongue is known as the foramen cecum from which you had the thyroglossal duct originating. So, the cranial end of the thyroglossal duct is actually seen as foramen cecum. The caudal end, what happens to the caudal end of the thyroglossal duct? This diverticulum actually grows along the midline into the neck and when it reaches uh, the future position of the thyroid gland, it just divides into bilobed mass. So, you, you get two lobes at the end of the thyroglossal duct. This will be actually giving rise to the formation of isthmus. Isthmus means uh, the connecting li link between the two lobes, the lateral lobes of the thyroid gland. So, uh, the thyroglossal duct as it moves down, it will be dividing into two masses, that is bilobed mass and this will be giving rise to the formation of isthmus and lateral lobes of the thyroid gland. But uh, what about the parafollicular cells? The parafollicular cells are derived from the ultimobranchial body which is a part of the caudal pharyngeal complex. So, we have already mentioned what do you mean by caudal pharyngeal complex? It is nothing but the fusion of fourth and fifth pharyngeal pouches. Now, what about the fate of the thyroglossal duct? The final position of the thyroglossal duct is actually in front of the trachea by seventh week. Sometimes along the duct, uh, a portion will remain as a cyst that is known as thyroglossal cyst and the thyroglossal cyst may communicate with the exterior and that condition is known as thyroglossal fistula. Uh, sometimes what happens is along the path of descent, uh, the thyroid gland may develop similar tissues along the path of descent of the thyroglossal duct. So, as a result, it's uh, usually the thyroglossal duct is starting from the base of the tongue. So, if it is giving rise to thyroid gland at the region of tongue, that is at the base of the tongue, you call it as lingual thyroid, that was our opening case. So, uh, that is called known as aberrant thyroid tissue. That means thyroid tissue is actually meant to be present in the neck region. So, sometimes it can be seen anywhere along the uh, descent of the thyroglossal duct. So, if it is seen at the region of the uh, tongue itself, you can call it as lingual thyroid. Now, uh, the thyroglossal duct may persist just above the isthmus as a small prolongation and that is known as the pyramidal lobe of thyroid gland. Usually, it reaches up to the isthmus and it just degenerates. Sometimes, it might stop just above a portion of the isthmus so that that tissue also that region also will be developing as the thyroid tissue. So, that prolongation from the isthmus is considered as the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid gland and sometimes levator glandular thyroidia will be seen attached to this pyramidal lobe of thyroid gland. At this venture, we will discuss about the development of tongue as well. Uh, this is actually the floor of the pharynx as viewed from the inner aspect. You can see the pharyngeal arches on either side. These are actually the cross sections of the pharyngeal arches. Now, the medial end of the first arch, you, you just concentrate on the first arch. This is the medial end. The medial end of the first arches proliferate to form two swellings. So, these two swellings are known as lingual swellings. Now, lingual swellings are actually uh, separated in the midline. They are not uh, allowed to fuse completely. So, they are separated in the midline by another swelling and that is known as the tuberculum impar. Now, hypobranchial eminence is yet another swelling seen posteriorly and it is derived from the second arch, third arch and fourth arch. 
So you just concentrate on this region that is blue colored, yellow colored and green colored region. These are the three arches, second, third and fourth arches. And from these three arches you have the formation of hypobranchial eminence. So uh, for the formation of tongue you have the four arches on either side. From the first arch you have the lingual swellings and again the tuberculum impar is also lying in this region. Then second, third and fourth arch gives rise to a prominence known as the hypobranchial eminence. So let us see what are the derivatives of these structures. The anterior two-third of the tongue, this is lightly orange in color. The anterior two-third of the tongue is actually formed from the two lingual swellings and the tuberculum impar. You just concentrate on the colors. Now, what about the posterior one-third? This is considered as a posterior one-third. Posterior one-third is actually formed from the cranial part of hypobranchial eminence, but you are not able to make out the blue color here. The reason is the third arch is actually overgrowing the second arch and fusing with the first arch. So when you look at the floor, you won't be seeing the second arch because it is embedded and uh, this is actually covered by the third arch. So the third arch encroaches over the second arch in order to reach the first arch. That is the reason why uh, the posterior one third of the tongue is having only contribution from the third arch. And this again uh, explains the nerve supply of the tongue. Because the anterior two third you have the lingual nerve which is a branch of mandibular nerve. Mandibular nerve is the nerve of the first arch. That is clear. But second arch nerve is facial nerve, but you are not uh, getting the particular nerve supply here. But the third arch nerve is glossopharyngeal nerve. That is the reason why the posterior one third is actually uh, getting the nerve supply from the glossopharyngeal nerve. Now, uh, this is the first arch with the derivatives that is the lingual swellings. Then you have the tuberculum impar, then you have the hypobranchial eminence derived from the second, third and fourth arches and uh, the third arch is actually overgrowing the second arch so that the second arch is trapped between the first and third arch. So the mesoderm of the third arch as we have already mentioned encroaches over the buried mesoderm of the second arch to fuse with the mesoderm of the first arch. The posterior most part. We just mentioned about the anterior two-third, posterior one-third. The posterior most part is actually formed from the caudal part of the hypobranchial eminence. This is considered as the hypobranchial eminence. This is the cranial portion and this is the caudal portion. So the posterior most part of the tongue is developed from the caudal portion of the hypobranchial eminence. Talking about the muscles of tongue, the musculature of the tongue is derived from the occipital myotomes. So this is uh, the development of innervation in a nutshell. Let us see uh, the motor nerve supply. The motor nerve supply is by the hypoglossal nerve and it is supplying the derivatives of the occipital myotomes. The sensory nerve supply, we have already done a correlation of development with innervation. That is the anterior two-third, the general nerve supply is from the nerve of the first arch, that is the lingual nerve. But a special branch, that is the cordy tympani nerve, is actually the pre-traumatic nerve coming from the second arch. Now coming to the posterior one-third, Posterior one-third, you are not getting the second arch contribution because the third arch is overgrowing the second arch to meet the first arch. So the general and sensory are supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Then posterior most branch is actually derived from the caudal part of the hypobranchial eminence and the fourth arch nerve is the superior laryngeal nerve. So that is the reason why the posterior most part of the tongue is getting the nerve supply from the superior laryngeal nerve. So this is the correlation of development of the tongue with respect to innervation. Now it is again uh, the same thing, the anterior two-third of the tongue is supplied by the lingual nerve which is a branch of mandibular nerve. That lingual nerve is actually the post-traumatic nerve whereas the caudate tympani nerve which is a nerve of taste is actually the pre-traumatic nerve. So only the first arch is having the post-traumatic as well as pre-traumatic nerve. Now coming to the applied aspect, this is the branchial fistula. Suppose uh, the second arch fails to grow caudally. We, are, we have already seen the derivatives of the ectodermal clefts, right? Only the first cleft is giving rise to the external acoustic meatus, whereas the second, third and fourth clefts are just getting obliterated. 
Suppose what happens if this second pharyngeal arch is not growing caudally. If it is not growing caudally, these three clefts will be remaining open. So the second, third and fourth clefts will remain open making a contact with the surface. So there are two types of uh, fistulas. One is known as the external branchial fistula. What do you mean by external branchial fistula? This is actually seen as the lateral cervical cyst in front of the sternocleidomastoid. They will be communicating with the exterior. But uh, what do you mean by the internal branchial fistula? This fistula, this is a fistulous tract. This fistula will be communicating uh, or this sinus will be opening in the tonsillar region. So this is the region of future palatine tonsil. So if it is opening towards the endodermal region, you call it as internal branchial fistula. And if the clefts are opening to the exterior aspect, you call it as external branchial fistula. Now thyroglossal cyst, we have already mentioned along the thyroglossal duct, some portion of it will remain as a cyst and that is known as thyroglossal cyst. And if this cyst communicates with the exterior, you call it as thyroglossal fistula. So to summarize, in this session, we have seen the formation of pharyngeal apparatus. They are nothing but uh, pharyngeal arches along with the ectodermal clefts and ectoderm endodermal pouches. They are six in number in the beginning, seen on the ventral aspect of the primitive pharynx as U-shaped arches. Out of the six arches, fifth usually disappears and ultimately you will be having only five arches and their derivatives. So we have discussed about the five arches, uh, their derivatives. Then we have seen the development of the thyroid gland, the development of the tongue and a little bit of applied aspects. That's the end of the uh, pharyngeal apparatus. Thank you.